Radio Liberty presents an interview with Norman Dodd. Well, looking back through the years, I had the unique opportunity in 1980 to interview Norman Dodd, who had been the director of research for the Reese Committee that had investigated the great tax-exempt foundations. And there were a lot of questions at that time why the Ford Foundation and the Carnegie Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, were actually working against the best interests of our country. And, of course, uh, what the committee had found, it was known as the Reese Committee, it was a congressional committee appointed when President Eisenhower became president in 1953, and the Congress at that time was under Republican control. They found that the great tax-exempt foundations had actually been instrumental in bringing communism to China, had perpetuated the lie in this country, in the United States, uh, that Chairman Mao was an agrarian reformer, that there was no communism, that these were communists that were taking over, and that uh, certainly uh, that China should never be under nationalist control, that Chiang Kai-shek, General Chiang Kai-shek, who led the nationalists, was a dangerous villain, and that Chairman Mao was simply a wonderful leader, sort of the Robin Hood of China, the George Washington of, the, of this new revolution that was going to make a better China. And yet, of course, he was a vicious, well-known communist who eventually executed and killed and tortured to death over a hundred million people. Well, of course, we didn't know all those facts in 1980, but uh, we knew that communism had come to China. We knew that the American State Department had been instrumental in that, and the great tax exempt foundations had played an important part in propagandizing uh, the American people. We also knew that the great tax exempt foundations had been working to bring socialism to the United States to change our society. And certainly they'd gotten people into the uh, universities, uh, they'd established chairs at the great universities, and they were pushing Marxism. And of course, uh, there'd been a book that had come out in 1958. It was written by Reddy Warmser, who was the counsel for the Reese Committee, and he wrote a book called Foundations, Their Power and Influence. And, of course, it was a very important book that was thoroughly suppressed in the United States. In fact, I talked to the publisher who told me that even when he gave copies of the books to the major public libraries, it wasn't very long before somebody stole those copies off the shelves of the libraries all across America, because the last thing they wanted was for the American people to know what the great tax exam foundations were doing. Well, when I interviewed Norman Dodd in 18, 1980, he told me a number of things, and, and certainly one of them was the story uh, of how he had sent one of his people to go through the minutes of the of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and this was uh, you know, in 1953 and 1954. And this woman, her name was Catherine Casey. And she really uh, had been actually sent to spy upon the committee. She uh, wasn't sympathetic. She was not sympathetic with the investigation. Uh, but that uh, she, when she came back from going through the minutes of the meetings of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and she had specifically done the years 1908 to 1909 and 1909 to 1910. Now, this was before the uh, the foundation was actually in the incorporated, but the board was still holding meetings at that time. And uh, Catherine Casey had found that the board had spent the year 1908 to 1909 determining how they would go about changing the world and bringing about international peace and bringing about this world government uh, that the intellectuals at that time wanted. And they decided that the best way to change the world was through war. A great war would change the world, and it would not be the same again. Then they spent the year 1909 to 1910 determining how they would create a world war and bring the United States into it. Well, of course, it's very hard to believe that people would actually plan wars simply to change the world, but that was uh, 
what Catherine Casey found. That's what she told Norman Dodd. Uh, she recorded her findings, and, of course, he tells that story in our interview. The other interesting thing that he brought out was the fact that uh, when he had gone to, to, uh, to visit the president of the Ford Foundation, Rowan Gaither, Rowan Gaither had started the conversation by saying, Mr. Dodd, why is Congress investigating us, the Ford Foundation? And um, Norman Dodd said, well, because I think that, uh, you know, many people are concerned that you're working against the best interests of the United States. And Rowan Gaither said, would you like to know what we're really doing, why we're doing it? And and uh, Norman Dodd said, well, yes. And, and Rowan Gaither said, well, we're operating under a presidential directive. Most of us have actually worked for government in the past. We're used to operating under directives. And our job is to so alter life in the United States that one day the United States can be peacefully merged with the Soviet Union. And Mr. Todd was totally taken aback by this. And he said, well, well, will you tell that to the American people? And Rowan Gaither said, of course not. And that, you see, what it's really all about. There is a conscious, organized effort to so alter life in the United States that one day it could be peacefully merged with the Soviet Union. That was 29 years ago when I interviewed Norman Dodd. Uh, and, of course, uh, he, he that, uh, the interview then had taken place, what, 26 years before that. So uh, the program has been in place for a long time. And this is what we call globalism today. That's why, as you look and see what's going on, there's been a conscious effort to destroy farming here in the United States. I live in California, where uh, where the Central Valley, once the breadbasket of America, in fact, part of the breadbasket of the world, producing fruits and vegetables and, and food that was shipped throughout the world, why the fields there are fallow today, and they're fallow because of the government has shut off water to the Central Valley because of a three-inch smelt. And the water, there's plenty of water, but it's being allowed simply to flow out to the ocean because they have to protect a three-inch smelt that has been deemed by government, by the EPA, and by uh, other environmental organizations to be in danger. So we are going to stop producing food in California at least in large segments of California, to protect a three-inch smelt, which may seem absurd, but it's no more absurd than the rest of the things that are happening today in California. And, of course, this is being recorded on, certainly in the year 2009, the fall, year, fall of 2009. In the Central Valley of California, there's 40% unemployment, and uh, this is one of the major reasons why the tax income in our state is down. But businesses are closing. They're destroying systematically the fishing industry. Uh, they're certainly uh, t t tearing down dams across America. Over 400 have been torn down, and that's so that they're, uh, the water table will drop. There'll be shortages of water. There won't be water for farming, uh, so that we'll have flooding, so we won't be able to have a very cheap form of electricity with hydroelectric electricity. So cheap, I mean, uh, two or three cents a kilowatt, uh, that, of course, uh, we wouldn't have electric problems, but we're going to have problems because that's what's planned. And then, of course, we can uh, get into the fact that they've effectively destroyed our our financial institutions. I mean, hundreds of banks will have closed by the time you uh, see this film, and they intend to destroy uh, the very financial structure of our society because most of our banks have, are actually bankrupt. Uh, they simply do not have enough assets to um, uh, meet the financial requirements put forward by the by the federal government. And then, of course, we can get on into oh, General Motors has become government motors. And, of course, uh, they are creating jobs. We gave them $50 billion to uh, create jobs, and General Motors is creating jobs. They're creating jobs in China and in India and in Russia and Brazil, the so-called brick nations, but they're not creating jobs in America. They're closing down factories in America. They're closing down dealerships in America. 
And, of course, the whole idea is to shift American production overseas. Uh, they've destroyed fairly well the housing industry in the United States. Uh, small industries are leaving the United States. Our jobs are going overseas. Already they've sent 8 million American jobs overseas in the conscious effort to lower our living standards. Uh, the kitchen industries are shutting down. The lumber industry in America has been destroyed. The mining industry has been destroyed. The medical practice has been destroyed, and I was a medical doctor for many years, and, and they've destroyed the practice of medicine and bankrupted our, our entire system and changed the moral structure and outlook of the d doctors, and see the, of the oil industries and, and real problems. We have enough oil in America to be the leading oil producer. We have oil off of both shores. We're not allowed to, to uh, to develop the oil deposits. We have massive oil deposits in the shale, enough to last us a couple of hundred years, but we're not allowed to develop that. Massive supplies of oil are available in the Arctic Wildlife Reserve, but we can't do anything there because of the wildflowers that bloom a few weeks a year up in the Arctic, above the Arctic Circle. Uh, we can't develop the great oil pool that's up north of Prudhoe Bay, and there are massive supplies of oil there. And, of course, the railway system is beginning to break down. The transportation system is beginning to break down. The trucking industry is beginning to break down. And it is all part of an organized effort to destroy the industries of our nation, uh, to lower our living standards, so we will soon be able to be peacefully merged with, with uh, Russia and China and communist Cuba and other communist uh, and third world nations throughout the world. The idea, I always like to say, is to raise the living standards of the, of the average American to that of the American peasant, of the Mexican peasant, so we can all live happily. They know exactly what they're doing. Now, another thing that uh, that we've learned about the great tax exam foundations that we're talking about Rockefeller, Carnegie and Ford is that the, at least the Rockefeller Foundation was instrumental in financing Alfred Kinsey and his effort to destroy the moral fabric of our society. And, of course, uh, Alfred Kinsey, supposedly a scientist, really wasn't. Uh, he was a, a massacist. He was a homosexual. He worked very closely with pedophiles. His purpose and goal was to destroy the moral fabric of our society. And it was financed by the Rockefeller Foundation. And, of course, if you read the book, uh, foundations, their power and influence, you'll find that the Rockefeller Foundation did everything they could to keep uh, the Congressional Committee that Mr. Dodd worked for from bringing this fact out publicly. In fact, they had their agents planted on the committee to actually interrupt the hearings so that nothing effectively would be accomplished. And eventually, uh, through bribing congressmen and uh, threatening congressmen, they were able to close th the committee. But the committee, known as the Reese Committee, which Mr. Dodd worked for, he was the director of research for the Reese Committee, the committee came up with a report, and this report is available on the Internet down uh, the Internet at the present time. You can read uh, hundreds of pages of it. Uh, it's put up there by Charlotte Isabay. I recommend you uh, read that, that you get the book, Foundations, Their Power and Influence, which we've kept in print for many years. To understand the diabolical efforts of the great tax exam foundations that were working in 1980 and had been working in 1954 to push socialism in America, uh, to destroy our educational system, to dumb down our children, and to indoctrinate them in the advantages and wonders of socialism and Marxism and communism. And that is one of the great tragedies of our time. And that is why the uh, the interview you're about to watch, I think, is so vitally important, because it was helped us to begin to understand what was really going on behind the scenes, and that people of great wealth were working to destroy uh, the United States.
27 years ago, the Congress of the United States authorized the formation of a Congressional Investigating Committee to try to analyze the functions of the great foundations in America, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Carnegie Foundation, and the Ford Foundation, for the Congressional Committee that came to be known as the Reese Committee. Mr. Dodd is an economist. He's a uh, consultant as far as investment is concerned. But during that period, that very important period, some 27 years ago, he headed research in the effort to find out what indeed were the great foundations doing in America. Mr. Dodd, what did you find out was the stated objective and goals of the great American foundations? We found out, Doctor, that these foundations had as their objective the orientation of the people of this country to the idea of collectivism and uh, thereby nullifying for good and all uh, the commitment of the country to individualism, which was the feature of the country at the beginning. Now, how did they go about doing this? Well, primarily they did it, Doctor, by, uh, by uh, securing control of what is known as the money supply of the people of this country. You're speaking now of the money supply that was going into education. Well, it's the money supply of the, of the people of the country as a whole. And how did they do this? They did this by working out a system of banking, which was foreign in its concept, but it enabled it, debt to be what we call monetized, transformed into bank deposits. Now, how did they specifically set out to influence education in America? Why, by, by having at their disposal unlimited quantities of this newly created money and being able to reward uh, the personalities who were active in the world of education, administratively as well as academically. Were they able to influence the textbooks or the teachers? Yes, they were. They were able to get, see that textbooks were almost produced by on order and assuring the publishers of textbooks of the funds necessary to make the publication of those books profitable. Now, have you personally had contact with some of the directors of these great foundations? Yes, I have. Could you tell us about it? Well, one instance, I'll use a, a couple of uh, instances as, as illustrations. One instance had to do with my responding to an invitation from the president of the Ford Foundation who asked me if when I was next in New York would I stop in their office and have a visit which I did and on arrival after amenities Mr. Gaither who was the then president said Mr. Dodd we invited you to come and see us this morning hoping that you would, off the record, tell us why the Congress was interested in operations of foundations such as ours. And before I could think of how I would reply to him, he volunteered the following. He said, Mr. Dodd, those of us here at the policy-making level have all had experience either with the OSS or the European Economic Administration in operating under directives the origin of which was the White House. We today operate under just such directives. Would you like to know what the substance of these directives is? And I said, yes, Mr. Gator, I'd like very much to know. Whereupon he said to me, the substance of the directives under which we operate is that we shall use our grant-making power so to alter life in the United States that we can be comfortably merged with the Soviet Union. <coughs> well, figuratively, I nearly fell off the chair. But I did remark to him, <coughs> Mr. Gaither, in the light of what you just told me, many of your grants make sense. I can understand them. But I do not think you're entitled to withhold this information from the people of this country to whom you are beholden 
for your tax exemption, so why don't you tell them what you've told me? And his answer was, Mr. Dodd, we wouldn't think of doing that. So I said, well, Mr. Gaithrani, ask, answer your first question. You force the Congress of the United States to spend $150,000 to find out what you've just told me. And so they've been pushing socialism in America ever since. Well, then, in the light of that, of course, you see conditions develop, and, of course, you then can add and, and ascribe the development of these conditions and the events that accompany to this policy. Because it's only in the light of that policy that these events and, and effects make any sense. And this is how, this is how, and this is their problem, Doctor. They cannot avoid having effects result from the grants that they make. They cannot avoid it. Therefore, those of, of, of this, in this country who would be concerned with what are they up merely has to look at the effects and work back and compare the effects of a grant with the explanation of the grant in the first place. I mean, I'll just use as, as an instance to clarify the matter. You will remember there was a time when the Federal Reserve System was installed in this country by the Congress. In other words, it was legalized. And there had, it had been preceded by a long period of years and a struggle to get the Federal Reserve approved. Finally, it was approved, and the argument that swung it, swung the approval in that direction was that if the system is installed, the result will be the elimination of bank failures. And in as much as there had been in those days uh, a plethora of bank failures, this was held up as a very bene beneficial development. Practice, Cent what they call fractional reserve central banking. But nobody goes back, this was in 1912, nobody goes back to 1930 when every bank in the United States was closed. Every bank. There wasn't a solvent bank in the United States. That, you see, was proof that the original purpose was in no sense to eliminate bank failures. And this discrepancy and these contrasts and these contradictions are the telltale part that the those who have imposed these practices on us as a people are scared to death that it's going to be picked up and stressed and taught and so forth and so on. But it isn't. No, and the mass media doesn't ordinarily talk about no, it. No, but neither does the educational world. This is what has to. This is what will meet the challenge. One accredited educational institution, with trustees who openly declare that we notice this, we notice the inconsistency, the contradictions, and we are setting forth an effort to account for them. And that, in my opinion, would explode the whole, oh, the whole network. And they have told me that this is what they're scared to death. Somebody is going to pick up this string. Mr. Dodd, what do you think is the basic crux of this whole problem? Well, Doctor, I feel that the problem itself originates uh, with that aspect of human life which condemns men collectively to experience what is known as the fall of man and that subsequently 
Christ became into the world with the, the and with the knowledge that the individual could confront this condition and um, not become victimized by it, but that th that uh, that entailed the individual emulating Christ, who through the temptations in the wilderness was confronted by the satanic, listened to what the satanic had to offer and say no and then add and i know you to be satan and satan went away that to me is the clue to how to nullify this um influence which has had humanity in its grip for centuries well <clears throat> of course what it means is that one has to accept the realism of the inclusion of evil and that in turn challenges the world of education to equip the, 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 the student with the knowledge necessary to recognize evil in action in, within the sphere of his own experiences and refuse to be part of it. Then this influence which has been behind the creation of this network can operate. It cannot operate in the light. And admittedly, it, you know, it says that it acknowledges that so that it is and those who are part of it knowingly are scared to death that somebody at some point, as they put it, they're going to pick up the end of a string and little by little follow it to the end. And as they put it to me, when that happens, we're through. Now, did you or any member of your staff ever have the opportunity of going through the records of any of the great foundations? Well, we had one remarkable instance of that kind, by in, again, by invitation. This invitation came from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and was in response to a letter which I had written to the endowment asking certain questions, seeking certain information. And this invitation was issued to me over the telephone to come to their office in New York when I was next there. This I did. And on arrival found myself in the presence of the Dr. Joseph Johnson, the president, two vice presidents and their own counsel, a partner of Sullivan and Cromwell. And after a minute, these Dr. Johnson said, Mr. Dodd, we received your letter and we can answer all these questions, but that w it will be a great deal of trouble because with the a uh, approval of, by the Senate, a ratification of the United Nations Treaty, we felt our job was done. So we took all our records from the beginning of this endowment up to that 1945 and sent them to the warehouse. And then we con concentrated on just using our funds to build this new building across the street from the United Nations which would provide the various organizations that would follow the United Nations activities with a place to meet. But, he said, we have a counter-suggestion, and that is, Mr. Dodd, if you can spare a member of your staff for two weeks and send them to New York, we will provide that member with a room in the library, our library, and the minute books of this endowment since its inception and we think whatever you want to find out you can find out through that source well my first reaction was th these men had lost their mind because I had a pretty good idea of what those minute books might show up but as I thought about it I realized that most of them were new in their position.
tradition. And my guess was none of them had ever read the minutes themselves, which would be, cost quite a task to cover 50 years of minutes. You know, reading. I accepted this invitation and selected a, a member of my staff, a Miss Catherine Casey, who was a pr practicing Washington lawyer, but who was on my staff to see to it that I, in conduct of the work of the staff, did not break any official rules in Washington. Catherine was also unsympathetic to the investigation. Her attitude was, uh, what could possibly be wrong with foundations? They do so much good. Well, I went out of my way not to prejudice her, but I did say that, Catherine, when you get to New York, you'll find that you can't possibly cover 50 years of minutes in two weeks. So you'll have to do what we call spot reading. And I blocked out certain periods for her to concentrate on. And when she returned to wa from Washington, her eyes were figuratively as big around as saucers, and she brought back to me the following on dictaphone belts. We're back in 1908, and the trustees meet, and they raise this question among themselves, namely, is there any means beside war known to man more capable assuming you wish to alter the life of an entire people. Now these are the trustees of the Carnegie That's Foundation. Right. And they discuss this question in a very learned fashion for approximately a year and come up with the conclusion that war is the most effective means known to man assuming you wish to alter the life of an entire people. So then they bring up a second question, namely, how do we involve the United States in a war? And I doubt if in 1909 there was any subject more removed from the minds of us as a people than our involvement in a war. There were shows going on in the Balkans, and most of the people of this country hardly knew where the Balkans were. And they conclude that they must control the diplomatic machinery of the United States. And that raises question number three, namely, how do we secure that control? And the answer comes up, we must control the State Department. And there, from that time on, their activities were centered on securing control of the State Department. Now, as a means to that end, the endowment founded an instrumentality called the Council for Learned Societies. And that council was assigned the task of passing on every high official appointment of the State Department before the appointment was confirmed. At that point, this finding linked up with what we had already suspected, but nevertheless, there was confirmation of it. Well, this happened, <clears throat> and pretty soon this, the country was in a war which came to be known, of course, as World War I. And this group of trustees at one point congratulated themselves on the wisdom of their original decision because, as they put it, war has demonstrated a power to alter the life of the people of this country already. And then their interest centered on seeing to it that we as a people did not revert.
subvert to our customs and our practices which prevailed prior to the outbreak of World War I. And they decided after the war was over that that meant we had to control education in the United States. And so they realized that this was a very prodigious task. So they, they approached the Rockefeller Foundation and made the suggestion that the Rockefeller Foundation take on half the problem and they retain the other half. They divided it between those subjects which were domestic in their significance and those which were international. And <clears throat> they together, the Rockefeller Foundation and the Carnegie Endowment, decided that the crux of the matter lay in their ability to alter the teaching of American history in this country. So they approached the then three of the most prominent historians with that suggestion and they were turned down flat. So then they decided they'd have to build their own stable of historians. And so they then approached the Guggenheim Foundation which specialized in awarding fellowships and said figuratively when we find a lovely young man who's headed to become a teacher of American history and will you grant him on our say so a fellowship and the answer was yes we will so they gradually assembled 20 and they took these 20 to England London and there they briefed them as to what was expected of them and that became the nucleus of the American Historical Association to which ultimately the endowment made a grant of $400,000 for a study to be made which would conclude what the future of this country was to be. And at the end of 1932, this study comes out in seven volumes, the last volume of which was a summary of the other six and it ended on the note that the future of this country belongs to collectivism administered with characteristic American efficiency and that became the I said I'm using today's language that became the guidelines for higher education in this country and then coincidentally with that then books began to appear, all of which were uh, detrimental to our vision of our own patriots who had signed a Declaration of Independence, and they were downgrading these men. Witness the last, most recent book on Jefferson that had to do with his having a enjoyed a colored mistress and things like that. But there's no reason to write that sort of thing. You know, were many of these books that have come out through the years funded, financed, subsidized by the great foundations? Through the medium of their uh, support of public, certain publishing companies, yes. Did the mass media in, in the 1950s adequate, adequately cover the findings of the Reese Committee? Oh, no. No. Was there any effort? Uh, most, most reaction through the through the media were casting were aimed at criticism of me as a personality and well, that and let it go at that. Well certainly when the book The Foundations, Their Power and Their Influence came out, this was basically a book that covered the background of the findings of the Reese Committee. Did this book get any coverage as far as book reviews? Was it uh, widely circulated? No. Did the public have an opportunity to find out what the great foundations were really doing? No, this book circularized or became circularized through the medium of what we refer to as the conservatives in this country. So it was, in a sense, um, a corroboration of 
what motivates the conservatives in this country. And they all had this book, and that's all there was to it. Was there any relationship between the foundations and the English establishment? Yeah, a very close one for um, doctors through the medium of the Rhodes Foundation, which was British, and the awarding in this country of Rhodes Scholarships. And the, and the beneficiaries of those scholarships ordinarily would constitute the persons who were appointed on behalf of the objectives of the foundations. I'll just use as an example a um, classmate of mine in boarding school, a man named Bill Stevenson, who went to Princeton, became a lawyer after going to Harvard Law School. And um, soon after, after that became the head of the Aspen Institute in Colorado, which was, as they expressed it in those days, a think tank for the indoctrination of the leaders of American industry in the ideas of collectivism. And humanism. As just as an example, another classmate of mine in Yale by the name of William Benton uh, had a fantastic career and finally ended up a senator from Connecticut for one six months period. And then Bill uh, left and went to Moscow, as he put it, for the purpose of finding out whether his interpretation of what was going on in Russia was the wave of the future. And came back and said, yes, he found out he was right. And he ultimately became the individual who did most to orient the Ford Foundation over to that point of view. And at the same time, Bill became the liaison between Moscow and Washington and the United Nations through UNESCO, the educational arm of the United Nations. It's all a, a, a dovetailing in to form a, an amazing web. Then, in essence, the function of the Great Foundations was to push this concept of secular humanism. Yes, well, that's a, that was a name that is relatively recent assigned to it, but in effect, yes. One and the same. Sure. But in ba basically, it's a matter of the, the world finding a name for the opposite of what our founding fathers created in this country. And of course, one of the names they found uh, and, and employed was capitalism. Capitalism was never a, sy a system thought out and, and advanced and proposed and promoted. It was a name assigned to a body of practices that were already going on but didn't have any name. So those who were advocating socialism gave these practices the name of capitalism and we've accepted it then that fell in with marx finding namely capitalism contains the seeds of its own destruction and what he of course what he really meant was capitalism as practiced contained the seeds of its own destruction but all these misunderstandings have to be cleared away as uh, and in some cases um, exp phases of experience have got to be defined well mr dodd if we continue going along the same course that we've been following in the past as far as our foreign and domestic and military policies are concerned what in your opinion is the outlook for the survival of america as a free and independent nation um, my opinion is that it will not survive. In fact, in my opinion, it has not survived. We now are not a free and independent nation. We've adopted the basic concepts of collectivism. Yes, and the controls are lodged. The controls of us are lodged just as they are the controls of Russia outside of these two countries.
We don't have any control over our own destiny and our policies are not formulated by ourselves or as a people. But we have no idea by whom they've been formulated and we're not allowed to know. I will never forget uh, talking to Norman Dodd, and he was a charming gentleman. And I, I asked him, well, how have the great tax exempt foundations be able, been able to change our society? And of course, I was expecting him to say, why, through the educational process. And he said, through the fractional reserve banking system. Well, back in 1980, I had no idea what he was talking about. Of course, since then, I've realized the wisdom of what he said because Norman Dodd had worked for many years in the banking industry. Banking is one of the greatest frauds of all time because banks create money out of nothing. What they need is a 10% deposited with the Federal Reserve Bank or... And then they can create, uh, you know, $90 based upon $10 they have on deposit. And it's simply credit. And they can lend that out at whatever interest rate they can get. And so uh, they pay the person who deposited the money, perhaps 3 or 4%. They can lend it out, or 6 or 8%. And they can lend nine times the amount that's there. That's what's known as fractional reserve banking. And as a result, then, the... The great banks, which intimately involved with uh, with the, the Rockefeller interest, and we're talking about Chase Manhattan Bank and Citibank, and of course, J.P. Morgan was deeply involved in this whole process as well. And what they then did was to buy up the media and the major corporations and to buy up the Sydney of uh, the a great deal of the mining industry, they control the oil industry, they control the pharmaceutical industry, uh, they control most of our great manufacturers, and they did it all with a fraudulent monetary system. Uh, back in 1980, I didn't have any idea how this worked, but this has allowed a very small group of very evil and wicked people uh, to gain control not only of the United States, but most of the wealth of the world at the present time, they're simply consolidating that control because their ultimate goal is to establish a one world government under their control, a one world financial system, a one world currency. But what most people who talk about this really miss is they want to destroy Christianity. They want a one world religion and they want to install a one world ruler. Now, as absurd as that may seem, why perhaps we can convince you that this is their golden objective. How would I know? Because I read their publications, and you can read them too. If you go to the occult websites like the Lucius Trust, the Rosicrucian website, the Masonic website, the Theosophical Society's website, and Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission. Uh, all of these organizations have websites, and many other organizations are out there, tying into something we refer to as the New Age Movement, or the World Occult Movement. Well, let me tell you a little bit. I, I interviewed Norman Dodd in 1980, and I knew that there was something else. There, there was an X factor I was I was missing. I mean, how could you make any sense out of this? Why, Sidney, were the people associated with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace willing to go to war and create the horrible and the horror of the First World War that uh, that Sidney killed somewhere between 14 and, and 20 million people and left much of Europe in rubble? Why would they have done something like that? And then, Sidney, why was the uh, Ford Foundation operating under a presidential directive to so alter life in the United States? that one day we would be able to merge the United States with the Soviet Union. It didn't make sense at the time. There obviously was an, another 
uh, another force out there, an X Factor as it was. And so it was about 1982 I encountered a woman named Constance Cumbie, who had written a book called The Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow. And, and I knew a little bit about uh, the Masons, and I knew a little bit about the Illuminati, but I really couldn't connect the dots, as most people can't connect the dots today. And then what's that have to do with the tax-exempt foundations and the Rockefellers and the Fords and the Carnegies? Well, I studied this, and I studied it for many, many years. I was involved for a time uh, in organized medicine, trying to address the uh, the, the AIDS epidemic as, as an in, a, a infectious communicable disease, sexually transmitted disease. And, of course, organized medicine was intent upon not addressing the AIDS epidemic. They were intent upon blocking efforts to do routine uh, HIV testing for AIDS or premarital testing or post, uh, prenatal testing, in other words, a pregnant woman, or postnatal testing. Uh, they, they were doing everything they could uh, to stop physicians and public health departments from uh, from uh, stopping this terrible epidemic, and it didn't make sense either. And I, I certainly was the leading spokesman in California, or one of the leading spokesmen in California, indeed across the country, trying to address the AIDS epidemic as a public health issue rather than a civil rights issue. And, of course, Dr. Lorraine Day, who came to be a good friend, and she kept telling me, Stan, this is all about population control. And I didn't want to believe that, I'll have to admit. It seems so such an absurd idea. Population control? Oh, well, it's got to be that these people are, are just foolish or the homosexual influence, or maybe, maybe it's the communist influence trying to destroy uh, our nation. Uh, and I even wrote a book called AIDS, The Unnecessary Epidemic. But eventually I came to understand this really was about population control. There really are people who believe in eugenics, just as Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party, and want to drastically reduce the uh, population of the world. And of course, if you doubt that, I suggest you go to Elberton, Georgia, where the uh, Georgia Guidestones are, the great stone monument there. It's a Druid-type monument known as the Georgia Guidestones or the American Stonehenge, the counterpart of the of the Druid Stonehenge in England. And uh, they're engraved in, in, in stone in eight different languages on the Guidestones. It is uh, the opening phrase, maintain humanity at 500 million in constant balance with nature. In other words, they're talking about killing off over 90% of the world's population. They know what they're doing. Well, through research and uh, actually studying and reading books about what's going on, I eventually was able to connect all of the dots and brought this forward in a book I wrote in uh, about 2000 called AIDS, The Brotherhood of Darkness. I had written AIDS, The Unnecessary Epidemic. My second book was entitled The Brotherhood of Darkness, which goes into the occult or hidden forces behind what's going on today. And what we discovered was, of course, that the, all of the men who created the great tax exam foundations were involved in the occult. Andrew Carnegie was involved in the occult. Henry Ford was involved with theosophy and spiritualism, deeply involved in the occult. You go to his library in, in Detroit, Mission, Michigan, you'll actually find many of the books that deal with the occult. And of course, then of course you get in the background of the Rockefeller family, and many people in the Rockefeller family have been involved in the occult. What is the occult? It is a spiritual movement that worships a different god. And of course, as incredible as that may seem, this is what is energizing everything going on in the world today. And you go back to history, to the time when Nimrod, 
uh, you know, simply well over 5,000 years ago, tried to bring about a world government, and of course he built the Tower of Babel in defiance of God, and of course brought all of the nations of the world through the Kabbalah, which was, of course, compiled by Jewish rabbis during the Babylonian captivity, it was simply a codification of the information that had obtained from the mystery religions at that time, passed on then to the Greek philosophers. Pythagoras uh, had gone over to the Near East. Uh, remember Pythagoras, who is the father of modern-day geometry, who proclaimed that A square plus B square equals C square the square root of the two sides of an isosceles triangle, uh, of a right-angle triangle, is equal to the square root of the hypotenuse of the triangle. And did you ever stop and wonder, how did Pythagoras ever come up with that? Did he sit down and scratch his head and say, you know, I've been thinking maybe A square plus B square equals C square? Not at all. He was a student of the mystery religions. He obtained the knowledge. He brought it back to Greece. And it was distributed to a very select few. And, of course, this was known to Socrates and to Plato and to Aristotle and to Alexander the Great, which is why Alexander the Great was able to actually, uh, you know, with an army of some 36,000 Macedonians, conquer the entire known world at the time. Now, for those who are skeptical and really don't understand much of what I'm saying, there's a wonderful book. It's still in print. Uh, it was called Plutarch, the Age of Alexander, written by Plutarch in the first century. And basically, he tells about Alexander, who was involved with the mysteries, actually writing to Aristotle. And and you get the book, index, read it for um, for uh, Alexander the Great and uh, and for Aristotle and the mystery religions, and and you could find the reference to it. Uh, so basically, this knowledge has been passed down through the centuries. What is the knowledge? Why the fact that there's a force out there that you can tap into, and when you tap into this force, you will have truly supernatural power. It is not imaginary. It is real, and I would caution people, do not try to get involved with this. You need to know it's there. You need to understand what energizes these people of great wealth and how they accumulate their wealth. But uh, for the sake of your eternal soul, do not ever try to tap into that uh, power that's there. Of course, these ideas then came forward uh, to... Um, into Christianity, and they made up the Gnostic religion of the first and second centuries. Uh, they were, of course, adopted by the Knights Templar uh, in the twelfth uh, and thirteenth century. Uh, they were adopted by the Rosicrucians in the fourteen hundreds. They were carried forward to the formation of the uh, of the Masonic movement of the Illuminati, and of course, are mat manifested today in the teachings of modern-day Freemasonry, and not one probably in a thousand Masons has any idea what this is all about. But, of course, if you read in your, uh, the writings of Albert Pike, who's the father in modern-day Freemasonry, or the writings of Manly P. Hall, who is, uh, when he died in the, the early 1990s, was cited by the Scottish Rite magazine of masonry as the greatest philosopher of all time. You will find out this is all about tapping into this power of Lucifer. And, of course, you can read the writings of, uh, of Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, known as Madame Blavatsky, who organized the, the Theosophical Society in the 1870s. And, of course, uh, she was the inspiration for Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison was able to, to come up with all of his ideas by tapping into the secret knowledge, the ideas of, of electricity and so many of the other things he came up with that changed the world in which we live today but all in preparation for the coming of the one world government. That's what it's all about, establishing a one world government, a one world financial system, a one world currency, and destroying Christianity. 
That's why they took God and prayer and the Ten Commandments out of our schools. Why did they do that? Because the Masons controlled the United States Supreme Court from 1941 to 1971 in majorities of 5 to 4 to 8 to 1. At one time, 8 of the 9 United States Supreme Court justices were members of a secret society. Well, the Masons said, we're not a secret society. We're simply a society with secrets. But they never tell you what the secret is, and the secret is uh, Lucifer is God, and if you tap into his power and give your life to him, you can become rich and wealthy and influential and famous as well. And this was the source of the wealth of Henry Ford, and this was the source of the wealth of Andrew Carnegie, and this was the source of the wealth of much of the Rockefeller family. And this was the source of wealth of J.P. Morgan and so many of the people of that uh, of previous generations, and yes, the source of the wealth of many of the richest men in the world today. They have given themselves over to the dark side. I hope you will take the time to actually uh, listen to my talks uh, on the Brotherhood of Darkness, uh, on the Forbidden Secret on the secret, on the financial Armageddon, on the world revolution. They're available at our website, radioliberty.com. You can get them through there. I hope you'll start listening to our radio programs at www.radioliberty.com, which is an Internet site that can be heard nine hours a day throughout the world. And we are reaching more people, getting them educated about the true nature of the spiritual battle in which we're engaged. Most people think this is a political battle or an ideological battle or a cultural battle or an educational battle. And it is all of them. But it is truly a spiritual battle that's being fought on a political, ideological, cultural, and educational battlefield. And uh, my plea to you is understand that the Bible is true. And the longer I live, the more convinced I am of the fact, as Benjamin Franklin said. I have lived, sir, a long time. And the longer I live, the more convinced I am that God rules in the affairs of men. And if a... A great, if a sparrow cannot fall without his knowledge, can an empire be raised without his blessing? Well, now you must understand that many people use that quotation uh, to say, well, obviously Benjamin Franklin believed in God. He did believe in God, but he believed not in the God of the Bible, but in the other God, which is the Gnostic belief that Satan is God. And remember, Chris, what did he talk about? How could an empire be raised? They were talking even at that time, America is to be the empire that was to lead the whole world into this world government. But I am firmly convinced he was right, that God does rule in the affairs of men. And if you're out there watching this program and don't have a personal relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ, why, of course, this is the only thing that's going to sustain you during the horrible times that lie ahead. And so I challenge you to become informed, to start reading the scriptures, start studying what's going on, to realize that the Bible prophesied everything taking place today. And I hope perhaps I will have encouraged you to begin looking and trying to find the truth. And you'll find it between the pages uh, of the Bible. And read John, read the Gospel of John, and then help us get the word out that we are living in prophetic times, that there really are people who worship Satan today, and, of course, that we are rapidly moving towards the destruction of America, destruction of the infrastructure of this nation, destruction of our economy. We're moving into a period of chaos and crisis. And the only thing that will sustain you during these difficult times is a personal relationship with our Lord, Jesus Christ. Thank you so very much.